Uh, okay. A few weeks ago, we uh, launched this poll uh, for several um, topics that could be of interest for the PhD students. Uh, I had uh, four topics um, in mind. Uh, one of them, um, emulation toolbox. The other one, uh, talk to TOAS for upscaling uh, reflectance to radiance. Uh, then we also have uh, this uh, time series data date times um, toolbox and the machine learning toolbox. And at the end, uh, 33 people responded. Thanks for that. And it appeared that the uh, machine learning toolbox was the winner, although closely followed up by the emulation toolbox, which is very similar, by the way. It's also making use of, of the machine learning toolbox in a way. So for today will be a tutorial about the machine learning toolbox. Um, I have 40 minutes time. I hope to give you an overview of uh, its potential and also the latest changes that we've recently introduced. I also want to tell you that uh, all these toolboxes are freely uh, downloadable from the website. You can find here below. And if you are even interested in um, having the latest version or being up to date, you could also contact me for asking uh, to uh, get access to the uh, HIT uh, repository, where you can always have uh, the, the latest version that with that in mind that, of course, when we make changes, sometimes um, these um, changes are not perfect yet. So it could be that um, sometimes some weird things happen, but in the HIT version, you have the latest updates. So. Today will be about the machine learning toolbox, uh, which has been uh, developed for over 10 years, mainly I was the initiator, but mainly by my, my former PhD student and colleague, uh, Juan Pablo Rivera, and many others um, involved. Um, um, the people here in the group helped me with uh, expanding the toolbox. And also over the years, I collaborated with lots of people, many of you that also helped me to um, further improve the toolbox. Also often we receive uh, feedback of bugs or so from, from users, and that's the right way forward to, to keep on improving the toolbox. So please, if you use it and you see um, some bugs or some suggestions just contact us so we uh, will see the uh, machine learning toolbox and i want to propose to show uh, four different kind of um, applications and options that um, have been built into the toolbox first of all of course the all kinds of uh, machine learning algorithms for uh, regression applications uh, that can be used for mapping um, also, because many of us, we work with uh, hyperspectral data, uh, second topic will be combining these machine learning methods with dimensionality reduction methods. Think about PCA, but there are many others. Third, uh, also, which can be very handy is uh, using some tools for um, applying band analysis. So this will allow you in an automated way to find out the most sensitive bands for your specific application. And finally, um, so far, these uh, methods uh, are mainly used for, um, can be for both um, experimental data so that you measure it in the field or for uh, simulated data coming from relative transfer models. Uh, when moving towards relative transfer models, these are models that, that we um, um, call them so-called generic models. Um, and they are uh, supposed to be more generally applicable because you can simulate all kinds of situations. Um, but to uh, tune them towards, uh, to make good maps, um, that's often challenging. And uh, we um, recently uh, um, explored these methods of active learning that, that we will see can greatly help to improve your um, um, so-called hybrid methods. Maybe first a few words on uh, terminology. Um, so when we talk about uh, machine learning methods, in fact, they are from the family of the non-parametric regression. Non-parametric regression, contrary to parametric regression, is that um, these are data-driven methods where you don't have to parameterize yourself. Actually, the models are being parameterized by means of the data that is being introduced to it. So in parametric regression, there we parameterize ourselves, the equation, the spectral bands, the fitting function, and so on. So we, as a user, based on our knowledge, uh, we the parameterize the equation ourselves non-parametric regression and mainly, especially the machine learning methods are purely data-driven methods. Um, other methods are the so-called physical methods uh, where you apply um, relative transfer models and try to invert them against your observation data. So these are the um, um, in RTM inversion physical methods. And we can also combine those by um, using simulated data coming from the RTMs feeding into 
these machine learning algorithms, also for mapping a place application. These are the hybrid methods. Um, so just with this background in mind, uh, our focus here are on the non-parametric methods for today. Non-parametric methods are uh, statistical methods. Uh, so the, uh, we develop statistical relationships between, on one hand, input, typically reflectance data, um, but that also can be radiance data or fluorescence data, but uh, spectral data on the one part, and on the other part, the variable of interest, uh, that the variable that you measured in the field, think about chlorophyll content, LAI, and so on. So with uh, statistical methods, so relationships are trying to be uh, developed. We are not so much interested in understanding fully these uh, relationships. We rather uh, want to find out if there is a relationship, if it's robust enough, can it be applicable for mapping applications? Traditionally, vegetation indices are being used. However, um, if I can talk freely, I would say vegetation indices are, is a much more complex approach than machine learning when it comes to optimization. After all, you never know if your index is the uh, most suitable one. So typically, you try to compare many indices, many fitting functions, and so on. So it's a big job. Contrary with machine learning, you just let the um, algorithm optimize um, itself by means of the data that's being entered into it. So the um, uh, machine learning toolbox is actually simpler than the vegetation indices toolbox as there is no need for selecting um, the uh, special bands or fitting functions or so on. All you have to do is just selecting your machine learning algorithms and then it's being trained, validated, and you can have your uh, mapping application a few uh, examples of um, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, implemented into the toolbox. Um, we have on one hand the classical ones. So these are uh, the so-called linear transformations such as a PCA regression or partially square regression decision trees. And then the so-called uh, uh, non-linear transformations such as uh, neural networks, kernel-based methods, kernel rich regression, Gaussian processes, support vector regression, many more. I believe by now we have over 20 different type of uh, machine learning algorithms implemented into the toolbox. We will have a look in a minute. Um, um, and you can also see on our papers or um, here is even a link of the source code if you are interested into having a deeper look into these uh, methods. So how does a toolbox uh, work? Basically, all it needs is some um, data for uh, training and validation. Um, in this way, you test the different methods. Uh, you get an overview of the performances of the methods. If you're happy with it, you can apply it to an image of interest. So very simple, just a few clicks are required um, to, to train, test it, and apply it afterwards to an image of interest. The uh, machine learning toolbox is part of the um, ArcMo framework. Uh, we can see there's much more to offer within the uh, ArcMo toolbox. And maybe later on, I can also give a talk about the other toolboxes uh, for now, just for you to know that the uh, machine learning toolbox is part of the retrieval toolboxes. Apart from machine learning, we also have this uh, uh, vegetation indices toolbox and the inversion toolbox. By selecting the machine learning toolbox, a new um, window will appear, and there we will go through these steps. Um, before we will have a look at it, I uh, just want you to give an overview of the uh, um, workflow of the toolbox. And uh, contrary to typical image processing software, it is very important to realize that for us, the image is not the starting point. In fact, the image is the final step only. For us, the starting point is the data data that can be experimental data or simulated data, but we start with data for training and validating. So that would be the first step is to um, define your data or to, to select that data. Typically, if we go through the steps here, um, can be, will be split into a training part and then the testing part. Within settings there, we will uh, choose our different type of machine learning. We have uh, other options. Maybe we want to add some noise to make the data, if it's simulated data, a little bit more noisy, like, like real images. Uh, maybe we want to um, apply dimensionality reduction. All these options are um, available within settings. Once you uh, 
define your settings, it will run over all these um, selections that you made and against the validation data, it will give you an overview of the performances of all the indices. Finally, um, if you are happy with the results, you select one of these uh, trained models that you can then apply to um, an image and you get your mapping application. So basically just a few clicks, I guess less than 10 are needed to come to your final maps. Here we just see uh, an overview that we will um, uh, do in a minute, but all that you need is uh, a text file with your uh, data. And this data consists on one hand of um, your variables of interest, so measured in the field, chlorophyll content, LEI, whatever. And on the other hand, associated spectra. Associated spectra that can come from a field spectrometer or maybe a bit of GPS. Um, these are just uh, the pixels from an image um, that was um, overpassed. Um, so that's all what you need to prepare. You pull it into the toolbox and you go through the following steps for your mapping applications. Um, we will now um, show some exercises. Um, these are the uh, main steps I would like to show with you. Uh, basically, that we start with experimental data that was collected here within an um, earlier ASA campaign. And we, let's try to evaluate these different um, um, algorithms. Maybe uh, just uh, before starting, a few words about how the data should be um, organized, because this is actually the most important to know uh, when aiming to use these uh, these toolboxes, how to organize data. So on top um, rows, we have uh, variables. In this case, we have um, five different variables. Um, I know that line two is chlorophyll content, line three is LEI, but it can be anything. By the way, it does not have to be vegetation, no, for the people of um, soil science or uh, in water. It could be other kind of variables, as long as these are on top are the variables and then underneath are the uh, spectra that can come from spectrometer or from pixels with the um, most left um, column. These are the wavelengths. So that, that's the all of the information that is required. And um, um, I can continue with the presentation, but from here, let's just move to uh, MATLAB and to the toolbox. Um, all you have to do first, once you have, uh, uh, you have the path correct of the toolbox, you just type Artmo and then the toolbox will be launched. And from now on, I will just continue with um, showing the possibilities directly with the toolbox. Okay, so the uh, main Artmo toolbox um, appears. I will make MATLAB a bit smaller. Sometimes some information will appear, so I want to show you that too. I already made a new uh, database. This is always recommended for the first time use of, um, of Artmo. And now let's go to the toolbox, the machine learning toolbox. Here it is. And so here we will go through the different steps, starting with inputs. With input, we have two options. Either you can go to simulated data that has been um, simulated within, within, within Artmo. Um, um, and we can talk about that another day. Or um, user data, what we will select now, uh, what we have measured in the field. So this um, window will appear where we can open our data. And let me um, start with a data set from an earlier campaign um, in, um, that was within the context of the Sentinels experiments um, already almost 20 years ago. Uh, but still, the data set is still very good. And uh, let's go for the variable LAI, which is line number three. If you want, you can add the units, you add, and you need to say from where the spectral data starts. Basically, that's all we need to do. So we can import, and now we can go to the next step, to the uh, settings. Um, by the way, they are, there's the option of a single output or multi-output models. Multi-output models would be in case I would have selected uh, multiple variables, then the single model will immediately able to predict these uh, multiple variables. Typically, this is done with neural networks or a few other methods, but most of the machine learning methods are single output. The setting windows will appear, and here we see the list of available algorithms. In fact, you can organize them according to linear models, uh, splines and polynomials, uh, neighbor methods, tree models, 
the neural networks that are available, kernel methods, and Gaussian processes. Let's show all of them. So um, as a starting point, we could say, OK, let's just try to select and try all of them. So I select all these 27 methods. And as a simplest way is to say how much of your data is used for training, for instance, 70%, meaning that the remaining data is used for uh, the testing step. Um, that would be the very basis to do. You could actually combine, um, in case you also loaded RTM data, uh, you, then this part gets activated. So you could combine so much data come from the RTM, so much from the um, experimental data set, or you could decide one, the RTM data is for training, the experimental data is for validation. All these kind of options are uh, possible. Um, this would be the uh, basic step, but over the last few years, we started also expanding uh, with uh, various uh, more options. Uh, these are available within band tools, data tools, and sample tools. And um, yeah, maybe also it's important to say the data set that I loaded, I forgot to tell, uh, is kind of a hyperspectral data set, but very simple one. It was with one of the early um, hyperspectral missions, uh, CRIS, with 62 bands. And I chose these 62 bands just to be fast for now, but for you, uh, it's important to realize it doesn't really matter how many bands. It just, because we have hyperspectral data, I would recommend to combine this with the dimensionality reduction method. Just let's start with the PCA method. So first we convert the data into components, uh, five is fine. And then afterwards we apply the uh, dimensionality reduction method. It's not really needed uh, with, with only 62 bands. It's now just for speeding up the whole procedure that you don't have to wait too much for the training step. So far, so here we chose for uh, splitting the data in just simple 70, 30 training testing distribution. But we could also decide to make use of cross-validation that make use where all the data is used for training and testing. And let me do that so that you get a, a nicer um, um, results of um, not only the models will be more robust since all the data is used, but also the validation is also uh, with more points. So I um, activate cross-validation. And to be fast, let's do a, a k fold with three subsets. So the data is uh, split into three subsets. Uh, two of them is first used for training, the third one for testing, and then it rotates over these three subsets. In that case, this part got deactivated. And um, now let's, uh, let's run them. So I click on done. And um, all the results are uh, stored underneath on a MySQL database. So I will just give it a name. So let's say, uh, Chris we, is a sensor, LAI is the variable. I used all the machine learning algorithms. I used five PCA and three K data a splitting distribution. And now it starts running. So for each uh, machine learning algorithm, in fact, we do it three times um, um, uh, for all the subsets. So uh, because of the cross validation it should go fast because we first always convert the spectral data into five components. So at the end, only um, five um, um, bands are, are used. Some models are a bit uh, slower, but others are really very fast. So I, I think this is, will just be a matter of a few minutes and we have the results for all the machine learning algorithms. Um, especially some random forests or neural networks where many options internally are being um, uh, tested, take a longer time. Um, still, I think we can do so because um, it's actually a small data set. And uh, meanwhile, uh, that it's running, of course, if there are any questions or so, just uh, start talking. Hopefully this will not take too long time. I had tested it yesterday, um, but of course then I was not using Zoom. Maybe this is the reason why this will be slightly slower. In any case, uh, meanwhile, I can continue uh, with the presentation and then let's have a look to the results. So, um, so this is the um, input data that we just uh, saw. Um, there are a few more options. For instance, sometimes you want to convert your spectral data 
um, to different units because your image is in different units. So you always need to make sure that your training data is exactly on the same units as your, uh, your image. This is a step that we are uh, doing right now. There are also options to add uh, noise. This is especially handy in case of um, simulated data that you want to make more noisier, um, that it looks more like, like real images. These are the uh, multi-output models that we have available. So we have five of them, uh, meaning that uh, they develop a model directly for all the variables of interest. So one single model will immediately give you LEI, chlorophyll, and so on. We um, just also, uh, we're introducing dimensionality reduction. So I just was uh, using a PCA, but in fact, we have um, 11 different type of dimensionality reduction methods. Uh, later on, I hope to uh, show an exercise. In fact, PCA is really powerful and, and, and I always use PCA. But, but if interested in trying, sometimes you get slight improvements by um, using these alternative uh, dimensionality reduction methods, especially for instance, the uh, kernel uh, PCA or kernel version of the uh, classical dimensionality reduction methods. So they are nonlinear they um, are supposed to be um, a little bit more powerful because of doing nonlinear transformations than the classical ones. Yet, in my, in my experience, the differences are, are very small and it just takes longer uh, training time. The other thing is the uh, uh, cross-validation methods. Uh, so here we have uh, three different options. The k fault is so that you uh, make different subsets. Um, Holdout is basically um, that you just have a training set and a testing set, but you change each time the data. And then there's also the leaf on out method, uh, where each time um, you train with um, all but one samples, and then you rotate over all the samples. So meanwhile, the results appeared. And let me show the white screen to be more visual. And now let's have a closer look to these, all these results. First of all, it gives you an overview of the different methods and it is uh, sorted according to a specific statistic, in this case, uh, normalized with mean square error, but we could also decide to sort it according to R squared. In principle, not much should change as these uh, goodness of uh, fit um, indicators are somehow related. So in this case, these Gaussian processes is the top performing with a R square of, of 0 0.98 uh, with this um, 3K cross validation. And then you can see the performances of the other methods. Originally, there were 62 bands, but it got converted into uh, five components using PCA. Now let's have a closer look to these results. And you can do so by clicking on plot. And then you have all kinds of options for inspecting the results. If I click on measured versus estimated, it will show me the um, um, well validation or the testing samples, but it's given that we used uh, cross-validation, you will see all samples. By the way, another option or feature of Gaussian processes is that it provides additional uncertainty estimates. And these are these error bars on the left, so it gives you immediately uncertainty of your, your estimates. You could uh, deactivate that in, in tools option. And this is only for uh, the uh, Bayesian methods, so the Gaussian processes. So if I would uh, take the second best method, sorry, and click again on plot, this is what you typically see, the classical measured versus estimated uh, um, figure. Um, that would be the first thing always to, to inspect. But there are many more options, and let's have a quick look at it. So measured versus estimated, we could also plot the residuals. We could also calculate some um, advanced statistics or show the results of the training data set. In case of Gaussian processes, a few um, interesting um, properties also appear, such as the um, band ranking of um, the uh, used bands. So if I select this and I click on plot, there appear uh, some uh, band ranking, and these are actually um, also the um, standard deviation of the um, bands, meaning that the larger the standard deviation, the more variability or the less 
um, useful it appears for this model. So meaning that actually this model above all was making use of, band, of component number one, component number three, and component number five with the lowest values. Another interesting feature, and this is, um, oh yes, so here we also have the uh, cross-validation statistics since we did uh, 3K uh, plots. Um, which we can also see the minimum of uh, the studies of these three groups, the maximum, mean, median. So we can see how um, similar or robust these uh, subsets are. By the way, because these results here are just taking all the data. Um, um, and so it, it has all the data has been estimated and then the goodness of fit um, indicators have been calculated. Since we were uh, making use of dimensionality reduction, PCA in this case, also, and this is something uh, from the new version, we can see the uh, variance contribution, let's say of these five components, meaning that most variance was within the first component, uh, second most in the second, and actually uh, two or three components already give you an explanation of 99% uh, of the variance, meaning that in fact, there is not really a need for so many components, but what we saw before with this uh, band tranking, the algorithms, they don't necessarily take the uh, components with the most variance because it could be interesting information is also in the later components. Um, also, we have the option to show what actually these components, where does the information come from? And this would be the uh, PC values. And here, uh, this gives you for the five components, the relevance over the spectral range. Um, the first component is just a typical reflectance signature, which may be um, well, is the most obvious, but maybe not the most interesting because more interesting becomes into the higher components, component number two. We see already some more variabilities in the red edge and in the um, green and red. And, and this uh, is further pronounced in the following components, uh, the third one, especially the fifth one. If you would add up all this variability, this is a third option you could immediately see where is the most variability taking place for this, um, um, this PCA, so which is, it appears to be it's in the red edge, especially, and also here in the visible, the blue, and uh, further on in the near infrared. So, so this is information you immediately can get if you want to, uh, and helps you to analyze your, your spectral data. Good, um, so these are um, the uh, results. We are happy with this uh, best performing model. So we can select it I click on map. It's being selected and we can go to the next step. So I click on done and now we can go to the retrieval step. Select an image, we will process the image as a whole. There's also a possibility to develop models per land cover class uh, for instance, maybe you have data just for grasslands or data for forests, so you could combine that. But in this case, I will process the whole image. In this GUI, um, you either have the option, in case that you did not want to do the validation step, to configure here everything um, yourself without validation. However, that's not recommended, and rather, uh, we already did the validation. We selected a model which appears here in the table below. So that's the model we will apply now to uh, an image. This will be this Chris image, the space-born um, hyperspectral image. I just have to select it. And afterwards, an output name is automatically being uh, suggested. So, so in case this is a Gaussian process from MATLAB and the LAI variable, I'm happy with this name. And let's process it. The whole image is immediately uh, processed. It takes care of uh, memory issues, so it can split the data into blocks. And finally, our, fi our map um, appears. Moreover, with Gaussian processes, we have uh, additional information, such as these uncertainties. On one hand, we have absolute uncertainties, standard deviation around the estimate, LAR in this case, which gives us information um, where the model is performing um, more uncertain, and the higher values more uncertain. And we could also um, show the uh, relative uncertainties where we simply divide the standard deviation by the mean and express as a percentage. And maybe this is a bit more um, um, easier to interpret as here, um, this is as percentage and you see immediately the 
very high values with very high uncertainties. Why these uh, places, these um, spots have such a high uncertainty? Well, not only because of the um, estimates are very low on one hand, but the uncertainties are also higher. And uh, why are these uncertainties higher? Typically, this is because these regions have not been introduced into the training data sets. And effectively, uh, this data set was mostly open the vegetated areas, so the circular irrigated um, parcels, and perhaps less over all kind of uh, bare soils or other uh, non-vegetated surfaces. So uh, with this, this kind of map, you can immediately see where the model is less certain, which can be handy because then you can go back into the fields and select more points from these regions to make your model more robust. So this was the um, very basic step of um, the toolbox. Now let's have a look to some additional options. We go back to settings and let's have a closer look to the dimensionality reduction. I no longer will uh, run all of them, so let me delete, but let's just select the best performing one, which was this uh, MATLAB housing processes. And let's now try to see the impact of dimensionality reduction. So we had PCA, but we have many more options. Let's just try all of them uh, for five components. And um, just to be faster, I keep this 70% for training. So I click again, done. And let's give it a name. So um, this time, um, so we go for LAI, housing processes from MATLAB, and the dimension T reduction methods, five components, 70% training, 30% for testing. It's now running again over all these uh, different dimensionality reduction methods. And well, one only one result appears, the best performing one, but we could show, um, for instance, the top 10 so that we can see the performances of all these methods. And what do we see? We see that PCA is actually no longer the best performing, so, um, but actually other dimensionality reduction methods are more powerful than PCA. And this, I think, is an important message also because many people, they use uh, partially square regression, which basically is just PLS plus linear regression. But it's really not that PLS is the most powerful methods. So you could see that you could actually make a more powerful combination by a powerful machine learning algorithm with a powerful dimensionality reduction. On the other hand, it must also be said that the differences are not that large. So we are just talking about small difference in, in, in R squared. Again, we can uh, use the best performing one and let's quickly um, see the map. So we take again the image and process it. In this case, um, it was GCCR. Yeah. And we can compare the maps so it's being processed. And I want you to show the final map because it also should be realized that even though this uh, dimensionality reduction method is more powerful, it doesn't necessarily need to a uh, better map. In fact, as we will see right now, is that it may have um, higher uncertainties, for instance. So this is the map. It looks very similar as what we saw before. But if you now have a look to the relative uncertainties, um, maybe you may remember from the one before. So we see more uh, spots with higher uncertainties. So to me, it makes me concluding that actually PCA is actually doing a decent job. It's maybe not the best one when you do the training testing, um, but in terms of mapping, it is, it is, it is robust. Okay, so this is the uh, dimensionality reduction part. Now let's have a look to some more options. Uh, for instance, band analysis to uh, select the or find out the most sensitive bands of our spectral data set. And these options are um, to be found here um, in band tools. We have a uh, Gaussian processes band analysis tool, random forest band analysis tool, and kernel rich regression band analysis tool. And they all work in the same way. We earlier saw that um, uh, Gaussian processes provides this band relevance. The way it works is that it first removes from all the data the least performing, least um, relevant bands, does again the regression analysis, and again removes the least performing band, 
plus again the regression analysis until finally only one band is left, which is supposed to be the most sensitive band. So let's run this quickly. And um, I will not do it with Gaussian process because it's a bit slower, but I will do it with kernel rich regression, which is very similar as Gaussian processes, but much faster. So just in order not to lose too much time. So I select kernel rich regression. I activate this band analysis tool. Uh, there are some options, but we just keep with the default. So based on the ranking of the uh, band relevance, and each time I remove just one band. To be it a bit more uh, robust, again, I will uh, combine it with cross-validation of 3K so that the band relevance is not just uh, based on the training set, but actually based on all the training set of the three uh, subsets. Okay, uh, so let's quickly run it. Uh, we need, again, need to give a name. In this case, we do kernel rich regression and we do uh, the band analysis tool. And um, so we have, we start with 62 bands, 61 bands and so on and so on and so on until finally one band um, is left. Um, and then afterwards we can analyze or we can uh, inspect what are these uh, most sensitive bands. Um, it takes a while because we repeat each time for three times, but uh, we have already the results. Again, it always shows the top uh, performing one, and we can already see best results were obtained with uh, 12 bands. But given that I have 62 bands, I could show all the results. And uh, we can see the best was with 12 bands, second best with 13 bands, when it is um, organized according to, in this case, normalized with mean square error, but we can also organize it according to R square, it should not change, exactly, it doesn't change. Okay, so this already tells me the, uh, with 12 bands, we can have the uh, best results. And now a few more options appear. Well, first of all, we can see the uh, sigma for these uh, 12 bands. So do the, for when moving towards 11 bands, this most one would have been removed. But now there is this new, um, uh, tools that appear, band analysis tool, if I click on it, there are a few more options that appear for analyzing the, um, well, um, the irrelevant bands and what would be these bands. If I click on OK, two uh, figures will appear. On one hand, the performances of um, the models, and on the other hand, the bands. Let's first have a look to the performances. So we started with 62 bands. And what is very interesting with hyperspectral data and, and uh, machine learning, actually there's really no need to train it with all the bands. In fact, that will lead almost always to suboptimal results because of many bands, they just provide exactly the same information. They just confuse the algorithm. It can be resolved by on one hand dimensionality reduction, what we just saw before, or on the other hand, by means of feature selection, so selecting the most relevant bands. And that's being done here. So we start with 62 bands, we, we removed the least uh, relevant bands and so on and so on. So that at a certain moment, res, um, performances start to improve. In this case, with kernel rich regression, uh, about 13 bands are the uh, best performances. And also very interesting is that two bands, this point here, um, it gives actually poor uh, performances. And this also to me is a strong message that why should we keep on using vegetation indices with two bands as we have many more bands available and a combination of two bands actually is a suboptimal combination um, um, given that there is actually much more information available that could be exploited. So of interest is then to check what are these bands. And here we have an overview of the statistics again but also the wavelength. So these are all bands, and then we go all the way down to eventually, finally, only one band is left. So in this case, the best performing band uh, would have been here in the red, uh, 592 nanometer. In case of two bands, it's a, a band at in the green, five to two. And the other one with three bands, there's a band in the uh, near added at 844. And so on and so on and so on. So in this case, best performances was with 13 bands, if I remember well. So these would be the top 13 bands for, um, in this case, LAI mapping. Good, this was the uh, band uh, ranking option. Again, it can be done with um, the latest version with uh, random forest, with Gaussian processes, with kernel rich regression. 
And now let's uh, move on to the um, hybrid methods. Um, so hybrid methods is that we no longer make use of our um, experimental data for training, but in this case, we will make use of uh, simulated data in order to make a generally applicable model in principle that can be applied anywhere. Or also, in case you don't have any field data, it, it shows you that you can um, always develop models just based on simulated data. To do so, first I will close again the toolbox and open it again that I start from uh, a clean toolbox again. And let me first select simulated data. I had already uh, prepared a small data set of 1000 simulations, um, um, very simple um, with varying chlorophyll content and LAI. Um, we select our variable of interest at uh, canopy scale directional reflectance. And in this case, we will uh, focus on chlorophyll content. So we add, and uh, that is important. Now we can go again to settings and we um, Before we saw that uh, Gaussian processes was best performing. So let's try that again. And let's first try a simple test with all this data, just for you to realize that it's not that easy using simulated data for model development because simulated data is never the same as real data. And in fact, typically we need to apply all kinds of manipulations such as adding noise, optimize the lookup table and so on and so on. Um, so for, let's use this as a starting point. I again, combine it with five PCA, I quickly run it. And so in this case, we have um, leaf chlorophyll content with Pro sale, 1000 simulations, 5 PCA. And let's have a look to the results. Okay, this uh, should go fast. The results should be really good because, um, well, we just simulated data both for training and for testing. However, what is of interest is the performance on the map. So the result is well, excellent, but it's actually meaningless since it's just simulated data. Let's have a quick look to measured versus estimated. So this is these uh, 300, um, uh, 300 points uh, that was used for testing together with the uncertainties. And let's apply this to the map. Uh, so again, retrieval, we select the model is there. Um, now. Um, one step that we did not have to do before, but because simulated data from the RTM's reflectance is between zero and one, in our experimental data, it was between zero and 10,000, I need to apply a conversion factor. So I um, divide um, the image by 10,000 and it's in the same units as my reflectance data, otherwise it will not work. Uh, we select our image again, and we have our output. Let me just add. Pro sale, 1000 simulations. And let's quickly run it just to see the results. I can already tell you the map will not look good uh, because nothing has been optimized. Uh, just uh, to show that um, using simulated data is not so easy. But uh, <laughs> now it will come, we have solutions and we will see this in a minute. Okay, yes, the map, it looks meaningful but actually it's not because the um, units are the range is completely um, wrong so let me quickly um, show it between units it's supposed to be between zero and 70 and then we can already see that there was a heavy overestimation the whole image was uh, overestimated map is meaningless also the uncertainties we can see it's very poor okay Let's keep this map just as a reference. So now let's start with um, trying to come to improve. And for this improvement, I would like to introduce a new tool that we have uh, recently um, explored and, and I would say it's quite successful. Uh, this is within the uh, sampling tool and it's uh, making use of active learning. And active learning basically is that we will select within the sampling pool, this 1000 simulations, the only the useful simulations for our um, um, regression model. And um, so we will introduce this. Um, 
I will uh, again use uh, Gaussian processes. I just, this is another thing in advanced option, you can change the properties of each of the models. And uh, to be a bit faster, I will change the kernel function to the uh, classical squared exponential or the RBF uh, function, just because I will do many repetitions now uh, as it will um, analyze all the samples and search only for the best or the most useful samples to train the model. Okay. And um, so we go to sample tools, we go to active learning. And first of all, we uh, have already our um, starting data sets, but we have to select a pool where additional samples will be selected from. In this case, I will just use the same data set. Um, so clerical content. And we can select all kind of active learning methods. To be fast, I uh, will select only the one where, from our experience, is, is usually the, the best performing one, a Clarion distance. We can uh, select how many samples each time is added, uh, being the evaluation. Uh, we can also select when it stops, for instance, when 100 samples have been added, mm -hmm. or if they are after a certain number of iterations, and so on. Another important uh, property is that we can run it against the, its data itself, but we could also run it against the validation data. In this case, the, um, our experimental data again, so I can load that. And let me, in this case, uh, so I will use the same file as before, but without the bare soils, because of course the um, algorithm, um, the simulations are just about vegetation. And when you compare that against bare soil, it will take long time because it's um, it, it will it's very difficult for an RTM to uh, mimic bare soil. So we just remove the bare soils, we load it again, and in this case, clear clover content is line number two. Yes, two. And the first line starts at seven. And uh -huh, also important. Again, I need to convert the units that it's the same as reflectance between zero and one. Okay, so let's load it. It's okay. And I guess that's it. Okay. And yes, so the matching chlorophyll content from the original data set and from the uh, pool should be the same. And also against the user data. Okay. We no longer start with 70%. No, in fact, we start with a very small pool with a starting data set, so let's say 1%, and then it will add or analyze the um, samples from the pool data set. Uh, to be faster, again, I combine it with uh, principal component analysis. Okay, that should be it. I just have to activate this again. Okay, to go to, and let's run it. Validation, so we have again, in this case, lead causal content, pro sale, Active learning. Um, and let's start running. Now it will take a, a, a while because we it is now um, starting from 1%, so 10 data points, and it starts analyzing these 1,000 samples from the pool data sets. And it will, based on Euclidean distance, so each time the Euclidean distance selects um, basically the sample that is the furthest away that has the largest Euclidean distance, it analyzes. And the criteria is if it leads to an improved model, it keeps it to the final uh, lookup table, the final training data set. If it does not lead to an improvement, it throws it away and tries another one. So we are now analyzing these 1,000 uh, samples. And uh, with the... Um, it went super fast because the it, uh, with machine learning, it, uh, kernel-based machine learning, it all depends on what kind of kernel you are using. Some kernels are really fast, such as the classical RBF. Uh, this allowed me to, to do this analysis. Okay, the um, results are decent. So um, now we no longer have these top results because this time we validate immediately against the uh, field data sets. And um, we can see, well, with very high uncertainties, but at least the estimates are within expected range. And in this case, because we applied active learning, uh, there's a new um, option appeared for inspecting a little bit further the active learning results. 
basically it will show um, if multiple active learning methods have been uh, selected, it will show their performances of each of them. And then afterwards we can, for instance, show the performances by number of samples. And this is more interesting because we started with only 10 points and then we can see how results improved by adding the right samples until finally uh, um, it stopped. It, it analyzed all of the, all the data and it stopped by adding, um, in this case, 26 uh, samples. How do we know that it was analyzing all of them? I could also um, show the plotting by iterations. And here we see um, how the performances were by evaluating all the samples. So again, only the, uh, when the model improves, these samples are being kept. Um, and for instance, we could also show this then as a function of R square, um, the performance by samples. So we can see that the R square also improved, perhaps not always, because at the end, the criteria, stopping the criteria for keeping it was based on R root mean square error and not uh, on R square, but you can see that the results um, improved until a certain uh, plateau. Uh, this um, is of interest to realize that it's not the quantity that the uh, defines performance of um, hybrid methods, it's rather the quality. Here, in this case, just with relatively few 35 um, simulated samples, we can lead to decent results. And let's have a look now to the map, and that would be the uh, closing of a session. I know I'm <laughs> over time, I apologize. And so let's select it again and apply the map. Um, I need to make sure to convert since we make use of simulated data. We select the image and we have the outputs of active learning in this case. It's running again, it went much faster. And look at this, look how much we improved as compared to the uh, data set when using these 1000 simulations. Now the units make uh, sense uh, between zero and over 70 and probably also the uncertainties now will make sense. So let me plot the relative uncertainties. Well, they are not too good still. Um, so <laughs> I was hoping better results, but so let me close this one. Let's have a look to the absolute uncertainties. Uh, they are quite high, so um, it's saying that even though we got meaningful results, um, the model um, is still rather uncertain. But still, when we compare against to the original map, we can see that at least the estimates, they make sense. And with this, I would like to conclude that actually with um, active learning methods, they are very powerful for tuning, optimizing um, your hybrid models. So based on uh, simulated data, there's really not a need for yourself to try to optimize by changing the ranges or the distribution or so ever. Just let it do by means of a clever algorithm that do intelligent sampling, for instance, Euclidean distance, let they choose the correct samples and evaluate it so that at the end, the computer can make for you an um, optimal model. Now you could um, uh, criticize me here that yes, uh, maybe that seems fine, but you are actually optimizing against experimental data, making it no longer uh, generally applicable, which is true. But here you can also play with the amount of simulators that you keep as starting points. In this case, I kept only 1%, so 10 samples as starting points. But you could also decide, OK, I take uh, 100 samples as starting point so that it's really generic. And then I add more samples by means of um, active learning. And um, I think with this, I showed the uh, main features of um, the toolbox. Um, maybe I should also show you a few small options before closing. Within tools, you can always remove or rename um, earlier experiments because it's recommendable every now and then to clean up because everything is stored within your computer. Within active learning, we have 1,000 models being generated, so it's recommended to uh, remove. Within tools, you also have options to uh, view your map again or view figures again. In validation, in loads, you can always go back to your um, earlier um, results. In this case, 
for instance. Uh, so let me show this exercise we did with all of them. And uh, there's uh, one uh, plotting option I forgot to show, but I think it's really interesting. And this is we are working on right now is uh, also sample relevance. And apart from band relevance, it is also possible to view the uh, importance of each of the samples within your training data set. So again, the larger the bar, the less important it is. Together with my colleagues here, now we are also developing kind of active learning as a sample analysis tool. So you remove the least important sample, you retrain again, and so on and so on. So in this way, also to optimize your sampling uh, domain. I think this was all. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit over time. I will uh, stop now with, uh, with sharing. And if there are any more questions, uh, please, uh, please let me know.